Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You can get over a broken past if you decide to believe that there's nothing in your past that can keep you from having a great future. I've got a little message simply called you've got what it takes. Can you turn to somebody and look at them and say, you've got what it takes? <laughs> say, I've got what it takes. <laughs> Do you know, the fear of inadequacy is probably one of the greatest fears that people have. Let's just say it again. The fear of inadequacy, the fear that we're not enough, the thoughts of I'm not, I can't, I don't, I didn't, I lack, And other similar types of thinking rob us of the truth of who we really are in Christ. We really do need to know the difference in our who and our do because if you're a believer in Christ, you're much more than the mistakes that you make. We have an identity of being in him and everything that he is and has, we also have. It's ours legally and positionally. It's in us by the new birth, and we are in the process of walking it out every day in our lives. It's literally almost like saying we are becoming what we already are. We're becoming what we already are, but we are that while we're becoming that. Amen? So there's so many things that we have that we don't really believe that we have because we wait to see them and God wants us to believe it first and then we'll see it. The fear of inadequacy. God will always give us what we need to be able to do what he asks us to do if we learn how to agree with him. If God says, I've got it, then I've got it. If God says I am, then I am. It doesn't matter how I feel or what I think. It doesn't even really matter what anybody else says. If God says I've got it, then I've got it. Everybody say I've got it. Amen. Now 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellence. You know, the word glory means the manifestation of the very best that God has. I want us to look at this scripture again. For his divine power, by his grace and mercy, not by anything we've done, he has bestowed upon us, he has gifted us all things. Somebody say all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness. That means God has given us everything that I need to live the very best life that I can possibly live, and he did it because he's good, not because I'm good. Everybody say, I've got it. <laughs> John 16, 15. Everything, somebody say everything. Everything. Everything that the Father has is mine. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Now, you know, I just got to be honest with you and tell you that even as I stand here and read that to you, and I believe it with my heart, my mind is having a hard time with that. <laughs> and I, I really believe it. But my mind is having a hard time with it. Now, here's the thing. If, you, if we really can learn how to live out of our hearts instead of our heads, ooh, that was good. If we really learn to live out of our hearts instead of our heads, wow, what a life we can have. In my heart, I believe. I really do believe that I have everything that I need to live a victorious life. I don't always feel like it, I don't always act like it, but I, I, I believe it. I got it. I believe I've got what it takes. I really do believe that I can do whatever I need to do through Christ, who is my strength. 
I don't always think it, <laughs> but I believe it. Put one hand on your belly and one hand right up here on your head. Now, how many of you know there's a big difference in those two places? <laughs> and so, if you live out of this, you ever, does anybody ever say to you, well, you know, just off the top of my head. Well, that's the last place I want any information from. <laughs> it's off the top of your head or the top of my head. Give me something that's deep in your spirit. Give me some truth, not just what you think. Everything the Father has is mine. <laughs> that is what I meant when I said that he, the Spirit, will take the things that are mine and will reveal, declare, disclose, and transmit them unto you. Now, Jesus is saying, look, everything the Father has is mine, and I'm giving it to you. Everybody say, I got it. But now, if we really pay attention to this Amplified Translation, he says, the Holy Spirit is revealing them to you. He's disclosing them to you, and I love this. He is transmitting them to you. Now, in order to, for anybody to accurately and successfully transmit, you got to have a receiver on the other end. So I'll tell you what, I'm learning to be a great receiver. Don't try to give me anything if you don't want me to take it because I'm good at receiving. You know, sometimes you try to bless people like, oh, no, 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 you don't have to do that. You ain't going to get that out of me. I'm going to be like, whoa, thank you. Amen. I'm transmitting life-changing messages over television, but if you don't have a receiver in your house, you can't get it. And see, a lot of us are still trying to get something that we don't have to get. We need to stop and realize that Jesus already got it, and now we've got it because he gave it to us, and all we need to do is say, I'm receiving, and how do I receive? Through my believing. Actually, the word believe, if you study it, means to receive, and the word receive means to believe. So if I'm a believer, then I'm a receiver, and if I'm a receiver, then I'm a believer. Be it unto you even as you believe. I want to talk to you today about your believing. I don't know what all is going to happen in the earth today. Whatever it is, I'm not afraid of it because I believe that God will give us what we need at the time that we need it. I don't know. Maybe we won't have anything but good things happening, but in case it don't turn out that way, I've just already got a mindset. Come on, the Bible says in Colossians 3, set your mind and keep it set. So I've already got a mindset. Well, gosh, gee, Lord, I hope I get everything I want, but just in case I don't, I've already decided that I can be happy anyway. Come on. I've already decided that I'm going to believe in you just as much if I don't get the manifestation of my healing right here in this earth. I don't know, maybe i got to step over the line and I'll get it the moment I step into glory, but I already believe I'm healed. I know that nobody can take it away from me. And I've already got a mindset that my faith is not based on what I see here in this earth. A lady said to me at lunch, uh, a woman I've known for a long, long time, and She's a, a woman of God. She loves God. She, she prays. She's a giver. And yet, she has a son that has been addicted to heroin. And no matter what they've tried to do, he just keeps doing the wrong thing, the wrong thing, the wrong thing, the wrong thing, the wrong thing. And so I asked her how he was, and she said, in jail. And she went through all kinds of things, uh, nerve issues and all kinds of problems, worrying about him and being concerned about him. And she finally realized that she either had to stop it or his problem was going to steal her life. Can I just tell you something today? Stop ruining your life over somebody else's bad choice. 
I said, stop ruining your life over somebody else's bad choice. You can't make somebody love God. And so I said to her, I said, how are you doing with it? She said, you know what, I, I'm okay. And, and here was what she said that I thought was so good. She said, you know, God is either gonna heal him and take care of it or not. And either way, I'm okay. And see, some of you might think, well, isn't that some doubt and unbelief? No, you know what she's saying? She's saying, I can't control his choices and neither can God. God will do everything he can to get the boy to do what's right. But if, even if it doesn't turn out that way, she's already made a decision that she loves God, she's going to be happy, she's going to bear good fruit, and she's not going to not believe because she doesn't get it the way she wants it. Come on, I think somebody needs to get a hold of this today because you're letting your joy be dictated to by what other people do or they don't do or if you see the manifestation of this now or you don't see it now. And we look at all that stuff and we put our mind on it and we think about it and we think about it and we want to know why. I don't understand why, why, why. And can I tell you something? Why is a question that's never going to stop being asked in this earth. Trust always requires unanswered questions. There's always going to be something that we don't understand if we're going to have faith in God. The fear of being inadequate is just another way of saying that we're afraid of failure. I'm afraid I'm not enough. I'm afraid I don't have what it takes. So I'd rather just not even try than to try and fail. Proverbs 24, 16 says, the righteous man falls seven times and gets up again. Somebody say, I get up again. But the person who truly knows who they are in Christ, I mean, you really know who you are in Christ. It's not based on how you feel. You know, sometimes I get up here and I feel really anointed. I mean, I feel like I'm just really in the flow. And sometimes I get up here and I just feel like, what? And man, I, I had to get over that. I have to know that I'm anointed. I have to know that I'm called of God. I have to know who I am in Christ. And it's not this head knowing, it's a heart knowing. Be it unto you even as you believe. Jesus wants us to pray and believe. Try to identify this person. When I was seven years old, my family was forced out of our home because of a legal technicality. I had to work to help support my family at age nine. While still a backward, shy little boy, my mother died. At age 22, I lost my job as a store clerk. I wanted to go to law school, but my education wasn't good enough. At 23, I went into debt to become a partner in a small store. Three years later, my partner died, leaving me a huge debt, which took me years to repay. At 28, after developing a romantic relationship with a young lady for four years, I asked her to marry me, and she said no. At 37, on my third try, I was finally elected to the U.S. Congress. Two years later, I ran again and failed to be reelected. At that time, I had a nervous breakdown. At 41, adding additional heartache to an already unhappy marriage, my four-year-old son died. The next year, I ran for land office and lost. At 45, I ran for Senate and lost. A few years later, I ran for the vice presidency and lost. At 49, I ran for Senate again and lost. At 51, I was elected President of the United States. Who am I? My name is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> wow. You know, I believe that the only way that he did that was because he was a man of God and he had to know how much God loved him. Now listen to me, when you know, when you have that revelation knowing that God loves you and that it's not based on what you do, whether you succeed or fail, whether you're elected or you're not elected, then you have no problem 
falling and getting up again, falling and getting up again, falling and getting up again, because you already know that you're loved. You're not doing anything to be well thought of, to be loved. You already know who you are, and nobody can take that away from you. You know, it's what you think of you that matters much more than what anybody else thinks of you. It's our reputation in heaven that's much more important than our reputation here on earth. I don't know about you, but I want to be famous in heaven. That's much more important than being famous here. 1 John 4, 18, we've been talking about fear all weekend. We have to take one look at this scripture. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. Now, can I just stop right here and say that dread is a very close relative of fear. And I want to encourage you when you go home to get dread out of your vocabulary. Do not look at a sink full of dirty dishes and say, I dread doing the dishes. I dread going to the grocery store. I dread doing the laundry. <laughs> I dread paying my bills. I dread driving in traffic to work tomorrow. Don't even sit here and think I dread going home. I know, I know some of you are already thinking, oh, this has just been so wonderful, man. I just dread going home. No, you, need, you say, I got it. I got what it takes to go home and have a victorious, good attitude. I can conquer the dishes. I can pay the bills. I can do the laundry. I can change the diapers. I can live with a, with a husband who's not quite where I'd like him to be yet. I can do whatever I need to do through Christ who is my strength. I've got it. Come on, don't make me come down there. The power of believing. And look at me, let me tell you something. You can believe what you want to believe. You're going to believe something, it might as well be something that's going to help you. Yeah. It's just as simple. Actually, it's easier to believe you can than to believe you can't. It's easier to believe you are than to believe you aren't. In God's economy, now listen to this, in God's economy, faith always leads. Feelings follow. Manifestations follow, but faith always takes the lead. Faith always steps out into what it's not really sure of. Faith doesn't stay safe in the boat. Faith takes a risk. Faith takes a chance because faith is determined to be all it can be. Now, you know, based on what you guys tell me, you, you love me, you like me, you know, you tell me, you know, I think you're this, I think you're that, blah, 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 blah. You've changed my life. You have no idea how frighteningly average and normal I am. <laughs> I mean, it's like sometimes I'm walking around and somebody will run up to me and say, Ah, oh, you're Joyce Meyer. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm Joyce Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> but see actually the truth is is I'm just like you and you're just like me we're all just a big mess with Jesus living on the inside saying you got what it takes if there is any difference in me and you and there doesn't have to be, but if there is any, it's only because I've decided to believe it and you haven't quite decided that yet. You can get over a broken past if you decide to believe that there's nothing in your past that can keep you from having a great future. You can't listen to what other people tell you. You can't listen to how you feel, what you think your own experiences. 
you fight with your sword. You fight the lies of Satan with your sword. I talk to you all the time about confessing the word of God out loud. And I don't know if you get tired of me harping on it or not, but I don't care. I'm never going to shut up about it. We have got to learn how to talk back to the devil. Amen? You know, when you go home, you're not going to have all the pretty music and all the sweet sisters sitting next to you. <laughs> and just to be really honest, you're going to go home to some of the same mess as you left. <laughs> we can't wave our, wave our magic wand over everything. But the, the thing is, is although the things may not have changed, you have changed. You have been strengthened. You've been encouraged. You've been empowered. Perfect love casts out fear. Let's look at 1 John 4, 18 again because I didn't finish it. There's no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full-grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors and expels with it every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment, and so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love, is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. So really, what is that saying? If I still have fear in my life, then that means I still need a deeper revelation on how much God loves me. Because here's the truth. There is nothing that can happen to us that God will not work out for our good one way or the other as long as we keep believing. Now, let me just tell you something, and this is a good thing for you to remember. As long as you keep believing, God keeps working. I said, as long as you keep believing, God keeps working. As long as you keep believing, God keeps working. And if there's anything that we must not do, we must not let the devil take away our believing. And let me tell you something. There is a, a strategy that's in place in the spiritual realm. A strategy that Satan has been working for several hundred years that's designed strictly for no other purpose than to get people to live out of their head and not out of their heart, to get them not to believe. All things are possible to him who believes. What is the work that God requires of us? It says in John 6, 29, this is the work that God requires of you, that you believe <laughs> in the one whom he has sent. I love that. I used to have this message going on in my head all the time. What do you want me to do, God? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? <laughs> I just thought surely my circumstances would get better if I could just find the right thing to do. <laughs> is anybody there? And then there'd be a little demon sitting on my shoulder, screaming in my ear, what are you going to do? 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 <laughs> then my friends would come along, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, we don't live out of a do, we live out of a done. <laughs> come on. He said, it is done. It's not about what I need to do. Now, yes, I do things, but I don't do them to get God to love me. I do them because he already loves me. You know, God has already given us everything we need to succeed in life. But so often it's our fear of inadequacy that keeps us from fully experiencing all that God has for us. We need to realize that the same power that raised Christ from the dead does dwell in us. Unfortunately, in a lot of our communities around here in South Africa and this region in KwaZulu-Natal, 
um, the abuse, the sexual abuse, uh, the physical abuse of as well uh, is quite horrendous. Even in the area we were, we were scared for the kids. It's not breaking when they're missing. I'm not going to let that happen. That's why I'm fighting for this area. Some of the children in this area mm -hmm. have disappeared? Yes, they did. What we did never you... found them. Before we open up this crutch, they are safe, healthy, good. So these early childhood development centers are not uh, little nice-to-haves or nursery places where they keep kids, you know, have fun and play games. They do all of those things, but this is actually investing in long-term benefit. This really is something that we can install into a community that opens up the door of the community for us to share the gospel and really stands as a witness, as a shining light into the community about the love of Christ. And we have such great opportunities through our Classrooms of Hope to help little guys like this who are going to make a big impact on the world one day. With your missions gift right now, you can provide safe classroom learning opportunities for young children. You and your special gift today will change lives.